a seat. <clears throat> Turn to number 211. I love thee. Number 211. I love thee, I love thee, I love thee, my Lord. I love thee, my Savior. I love thee, my God. I love thee, I love thee, and that thou dost know. But how much I love thee, my actions will show. I'm happy, I'm happy, oh wondrous account. My joys are immortal, I stand on the mount. I gaze on my treasure and long to be there with Jesus and angels and kindred so dear. O oh, Jesus, my Savior, with thee I am blessed. My life and salvation, my joy and my rest. Thy name be my theme, and thy love be my song. Thy grace shall inspire both my heart and my tongue. Oh, who's like my Savior, he Salem's bright king. He smiles and he loves me and helps me to sing. I'll praise him, I'll praise him with notes loud and clear. While rivers of pleasure my spirit shall cheer. All right, our last hymn this evening will be number 175. Number 175, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. <laughs> Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Alleluia, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior guilty vile and helpless we spotless lamb of god was he atonement can it be hallelujah what a savior lifted up was he to die it is finished was his cry thou in hand exalted high hallelujah what a savior when he comes our glorious king all his ransom home to bring then anew this song will sing hallelujah what a Savior! Amen. amen. That was a blessing. Amen. Hope you know that old hymn. That's a good one if you don't. Amen. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hope you're excited about that. Amen. I uh, think it's kind of amazing how we kind of are timid when it comes to 
celebrating the greatest thing ever, salvation. And some of the same people that are kind of reserved in church, man, if their football team scores, they'll shout and holler. And, you know, so I, I think it's good to get excited about the Lord. Amen. Before I preach, our youth choir is going to come and sing Finish Well. And while they're coming, I want to uh, make a couple of announcements. One, uh, I believe Monday is the last day of the month. Now, some of you that live out in the country like us, it doesn't make any difference. But if you live in town, I want to encourage you that if you've got a bunch of little uh, kids dressed up like who knows what coming to your door for trick-or-treating, if you're going to give out candy, you ought to put some uh, gospel tracks in their bag with them. I think you could use uh, that. And there's a couple ways to do that. You can order your own. We've got a few out here, like chick tracks and stuff. Uh, you might uh, look. Lauren found, uh, or maybe Samuel, a few years ago, we found some smaller, like, by-the-book tracks. And they were just real little, concise tracks. But if you're going to be giving out tracks, you've got to put good candy, too. Like, don't be that guy that, like, doesn't tip the waitress but leaves a track. <laughs> like, I'm a tightwad. Hope you're going to heaven. <laughs> um, so, uh, so do do that. But I know that some uh, places they're doing stuff Saturday evening. But Saturday evening, I want to encourage you, and especially the kids, uh, around five five thirty. Dad will will announce this Wednesday night. We'll make sure everybody knows. But uh, if you don't hear otherwise, a little after five at the ranch, we're going to meet, uh, have vans and carpool if we got enough people going. And uh, I'm preaching at Haywood. That'll be the last night of their revival. And Haywood is west of McAllister. But Justin, I always went down to Savannah and turned and headed. Cody Autry was like, why do you keep saying south? And you can just go straight west. And he showed me on the map. It's true. You can just go straight. There's no reason to go to Savannah to get to Haywood. But anyhow. And some of you people just never knew any of those little towns even existed. And you need to come down there and uh, be in church with us Saturday evening. And Dad said that all the youth that get up and sing, he's just giving them, uh, treating them at Brahms. Yeah. Yeah. So if you like Brahms, you need to come. Amen, kids? And, uh, but they'll sing. I know they'll do a great job. I'm grateful. I tell you what, it helps me preach when I know my kids are singing. Amen. And Thursday and Friday as well, if you're free at 7 o'clock, we'll be at the Haywood Baptist Church. We'd love to have you if uh, you want to come. I'm making my kids and wife and kids be there every night. Amen.
I like that second verse of that song they just sang. There's no truth in saying we've seen our better days. Now, for them kids, I totally agree with that. Physically speaking, some of us, <laughs> we might say we've seen our better days, amen? Uh, but, do you know, spiritually speaking, that shouldn't be true for any of us, amen? Spiritually speaking, we have not seen our better days because if God's given us life and breath, then he's going to give us a good day, amen? And a fruitful day. And so I pray that that be your uh, mindset and uh, your mentality. If you've got your Bibles tonight, take them to Second Samuel. If uh, you've been here with us, you know we've been going through uh, David's mighty men. We've covered the top two mighty men in David's catalog, his registry of mighty men. And that's how they're listed, David's mighty men. These were men that were honorable, they were noble, they were mighty, the Bible says. And the top three, there are really no blemishes on them, although we don't know a whole lot about them. They are somewhat, in the life of David, what could be considered unsung heroes, because there's no doubt that many of the victories David was credited with came because of the men that were with him. Now, some of the men that were with him were wicked. The Bible says he had sons of Belial, wicked men that had joined themselves to him. But he did have mighty men that I think kept those ruffians in check. And he lists those men. And so tonight we're just going to look at two verses. We're looking at Shammah, the third of David's mighty men. How many of you, if you hadn't been uh, opening your Bible right now to 2 Samuel 23, how many of you would say, I know a whole lot about Shammah? Well, there's not a whole lot to know about him, but what we do know here in the scripture we're going to focus on tonight. So if you would stand with me, make sure you're wide awake, and we're going to very simply, because this is a short text, we're going to break down kind of the account that we're given, the, the uh, information here, and then we're going to uh, hopefully see that there's some important analogy, I think, uh, to a New Testament soldier and the Old Testament soldier, Shammah, and hopefully make some application to our lives because I think that this is not a story that's here for no reason. Amen? So if you'll look with me, Second Samuel 23, we're going to talk about the bean field battle. Battle in a bean field. This is what we're going to look at tonight. Shammah and his little resume here. It says... In verse 11 of 2 Samuel 23, and after him, and by the way, after him, that's Eleazar. How many of you here last week? Yes. Remember? Remember Eleazar? Yes. Remember he had his hand stuck to his sword? And uh, I think LP helped me, Levi helped me with that. But he fought till his hand stuck to his sword, and God gave a great victory. Verse 11 now says, and after him was Shammah, the son of A.G. the Herorite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you. We thank you for your word tonight. God, I pray that as we look at this passage and this story about this man that you recorded for us, God, I pray that our hearts would be open. Lord, I pray that my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here would be edified and encouraged, that we would be built up for the work of the ministry that you've given us, that we would be equipped for that. And God, that we'd be willing to stand in your might, that we'd be willing to fight and Lord, to take part in the work that you're doing and Lord, it's my prayer if someone here is lost, never been saved, Holy Spirit would reveal that to them. They would feel your conviction and trust you as Lord and Savior. And above all, we want you to be exalted, lifted up, and glorified tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 2 Samuel 23, 11. Now, <clears throat> these first three mighty men, they have a collective feat that they pull off. The next message we'll look at kind of an interesting 
uh, story about the three fellas that went and got David a drink of water. But tonight we get introduced to Shammah, the third of David's mighty men. The Bible says in the Old Testament that when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, some of you remember uh, going back that Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, they received the law and they were promised victory as they entered the land that God had given to Abraham. They were going back to the promised land. That was their intent. And God gave them certain promises. In Leviticus chapter 26, when the children of Israel were not just given land, they were given a promise that God would fight their battles for them. And Leviticus 26 verse 3, the Bible says this, and I read this because we need to understand when we're reading about David and Shammah and these men uh, backing up Saul and Samuel and even before that, go back to Joshua and even Moses. These men had been given a promise that there was, there was a land, there was some ground that had been given them and that it had been promised to Abraham. Abraham had made a deal for a lot of it and God had promised to Abraham and his seed the land of Israel. Now, for 400 years, the pagan nations had lived there, the Canaanite nations, and God literally had been giving them space, the Bible says, to repent, and they were more and more wicked. And after 400 years, the Israelites were sent to enter the land and take it. And it says in Leviticus 26, 3, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, Then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit. And your threshing shall reach into the vintage, and the vintage shall reach into the sowing time. And you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land." And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. That promise in Leviticus, he said that a hundred of you will chase ten thousand. And please understand this. This is literal mortal combat that he's talking about. You're going to enter a land where there's Philistines and Canaanites and there's going to be Jebusites and Hivites and Termites. I always throw that in there. But, um, but, he's, but he lists all these people and he says you're going to drive them out. Even the neighboring nations that would invade Moabites and Ammonites. He said that, that you will have victory when you're walking where I tell you to walk. When you're walking in my law and in my covenant and you're in the land that I've given you. You shouldn't have to be afraid because if a fight breaks out, I'm on your side. And literally, Leviticus 26 implies that the whole nation was promised that they could be mighty men and they could accomplish heroic battlefield feats if they would just trust God and do what He says. I mean, this, listen, Leviticus, he's, he's giving law to the people in general and He's saying, here's what will happen. If you will obey me... One, five of you, which five? Any five of you can chase a hundred. A hundred of you, which hundred of Any hundred of you can put to flight 10,000. Now, I believe that God had done that in the past. Listen, when Moses and the children of Israel encountered enemies that attacked, and like the Amalekites, different ones, you'll see that that. God would divinely intervene so that many times Moses and Joshua would have victories and no casualties. Do do you remember the story of Joshua entering and taking Jericho? Great city, fortified, fell, no Israelite casualties. And then they go to Ai, and can I tell you this? If I remember right, there were just 30-something or so men that got killed, and it devastated Joshua. Do you know why? Because the regular rules of law, uh, regular rules of war didn't apply to God's people because he said, I'll fight for you. 
And one of the people group that was a thorn in their side because they'd never fully possessed what God had promised was a group called the Philistines. Now we know them. David killed Goliath, famous Philistine. And so as we break down this account, the Philistines would be the enemy in the story. The mighty man would be Shammah. We don't know a lot about him. He has an interesting name. Shammah can mean ruin, desolation, but it can also have this redemptive idea of ruin or desolation moving to like astonishment, redemption, or a wonderful thing. He had a, a pretty good name. His father's name was Aggie or A.G., however you want to pronounce it. But then it says the Hararite. And a Hararite just meant a mountain man. Harar was a mountain and a Hararite was a mountain man. And that's who Shammah was. And no doubt he probably had already had some mountain experience when he met up with David and became one of David's men that was running through the woods. And he was a... Uh, no doubt champion in guerrilla warfare. We don't know about every battle that he fought, but we know about this particular one. Because this particular account, he becomes the hero. He's outnumbered, and it's based on the text, it appears that he was alone. It appears that everybody else did something different, much like the story last week where Eleazar, everybody ran off, and by the time they came back for him, there wasn't nothing left to do but spoil. He had done whooped everybody and his hand was froze to his sword. Well, here we have a similar account and this time Shammah is the hero. The Philistines, the Bible says in verse 11, were gathered together into a troop. Let's break down this account. The enemy here has outnumbered the hero and the enemy is organized. It says they were a troop. They, they, they had an army and the Bible says they were on the offensive. Look very carefully with me. It says in verse 12, he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. Can we just do a little simple English grammar? If he is defending, what are they doing? They're attacking. They're on the offense. And the Bible says that they were on the offensive. He was simply defending Ground. It says he stood in the midst of the ground. That word ground, it literally means an allotment. It means something that had been given or allotted. And you may say, do you think it was his bean field? I don't know. I mean, it might make sense that it was his. That might be the reason he didn't run. But can I tell you something? It doesn't say it was his. It might have just been any Israelite bean field. Lentils. How many of you have ever had a lentil soup? My wife. I never did get a bunch of... Uh, Lentil soup. I will be honest, growing up, I had the absolute 100% best ranch cook. My mom is a great cook. My mom's menu is limited. Hey, listen, if it works, don't mess with it, amen? My mom's got about seven or eight home run uh, recipes, and she cooks for an army. I mean, I was growing up, uh, her favorite cooking pot looked like a five-gallon bucket. I mean, she made a lot of food every time we, we fixed food. And to be honest, uh, I don't remember growing up her making us eat like lentil soup or... I mean, her food was healthy, like meat and potatoes, healthy, you know. Um, but I remember after I married Lauren, they would have all types of bean soup. I didn't know you could eat meals with no meat in them, actually, until after I married... <laughs> Because Miss Terry doesn't always put meat and stuff. But, but can I tell you something? Some of the lentil soup is good. And when it says lentils, it's just a legume, a type of bean. And, and it, was, it was crop. And this was an agrarian culture, an agricultural uh, people. And they, they didn't have supermarkets, so their crops were their food. And so whether in, in, uh, in 1 Chronicles, in chapter 11, it talked about Eleazar and David working together and fighting in a barley patch. Well, barley and wheat and, and the rye, the things that, that grew, they, they used that. That was their food. That was their grocery store. And a bean patch, uh, lentils, they're high in protein. Matter of fact, most people believe that when Daniel and his friends asked for pulse to eat over in Babylon... They were simply wanting 
something like this type of lentil soup uh, and water. Some people have talked about beans and, and waters, what they wanted to eat. But the lentils, it was a bean patch, more or less, if I could put it in those terms. And they were on the offensive. It wasn't, let me just remind you, it wasn't the Philistines' bean patch. It was the Israelites' bean patch. And he stood in his ground and defended it. The enemy were on the offensive. They were organized. And I believe they probably initially were overlooking this one Israelite, Shammah. And if you're an army, if you're a troop and there's one dude standing out there, you're probably not too worried. But that would have been a mistake. We were at a conference not too long ago. And the pastor, uh, Pastor Fisher, was preaching. And he used the illustration that in Native American culture up in the Dakotas, there was a certain class of warrior that would carry one of their weapons, looked like a spear. But it had a, it had a rope on it. And many times that rope would be wrapped around their waist, is what he said. And, but he said that in, in certain times of battle that those men would make a line and they would undo that rope and they would drive that stick into the ground and they'd attach that rope to themselves, to the stick in the ground and that radius that they could get on that stick, they'd get their tomahawk and their knife and they would defend the radius where they stuck their stick in the ground and those men would defend their territory and he used that as an example but in, in many ways when I hear this story of Shammah it kind of sounds that way that he... He decided, the Bible says all the people fled. And this is sad to me because based on the promise that I read in Leviticus, based on the promise in Joshua chapter 1, do you know that in Joshua chapter 1, God said, be of good courage. I'll be with you. Don't be scared of them. And yet the people of God fled. The Philistines were charging and God's people were retreating. But Shammah stood, the Bible says. So in my mind, I see an organized army and I see a group of scattered Israelites running for the hills. And by the way, a lot of the Israelites, they survived by like guerrilla warfare. They'd fight a little and run and hide and then fight another day. And they just hit the hills. But for whatever reason, whether it was his bean patch personally or maybe he had just had his morning devotional that morning out of Leviticus 26... And maybe Shammah just woke up and said, you know what? I'm not giving them this bean field. You may say, well, what's the significance of being a patch of lentils? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like a city. It wasn't like Ziklag, their house where all their people were. It was just a bean patch. But when the troop arose, he stood, and then he cleaned house. He whooped them. He fought for his bean field. Now, that's the account that we're given. And it says this, though, that he smote the Philistines. That means he was fighting them. And the Lord wrought a great victory. Do you know, sometimes the Lord can, can, can work a great victory. It says the Lord wrought a great victory with no help from us at all. I mean, God can snap his fingers and wipe people out. That, listen, one angel killed thousands of the enemy when, during Jehoshaphat's reign. God can do whatever he wants to do. But in this, in this episode, one man who decided to stand, he had to physically fight the enemy. And the Bible says he smote the Philistines. And that means when they came at him to get him, he got them first. <laughs> That's what that means, you know. I mean, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it, kind of like Samson with the jawboner, when we read about the very first mighty man, the Tacmanite, Adino, the Tacmanite, the Bible says he took a spear with 800 men. That's impressive. And, and I understand, listen, I do believe, God, listen, God had to be involved. But do but you know that even today, we like stories like that, don't we? I mean, like Wyatt Earp, he's known, well, really well known. Do you know that history records that Wyatt Earp was involved in 80-something different episodes of gunplay where people were shooting guns at him? I mean, for in, in his whole life, there was about 80 times where that happened. 80. He was never so much as touched by a bullet. And that's amazing because when I hear about, like in McAllister about 10 years ago, a guy sitting in his tree stand and a stray bullet, boom, hits him in his tree stand knocks him out. 
I mean, that's a tragedy and people ought to be practicing gun safety. But think about this. There was a fella who, guys who carried guns, pointed and shot at him 80 times and nobody ever hit him. Can I just say that? I know that's just history and I have no idea about his spiritual condition. Sounds to me like there's a little bit of divine protection going on. And with Shammah, there's no doubt there was divine protection going on. The Bible says that the Lord wrought the victory. But can I tell you this? We know that Shammah won and fought and God wrought a victory. This is recorded because on that day, he was the only one that stood. Now, here's where I want to make a little analogy. And by the way, this is not a parable. There's principles in this Old Testament combat story that apply to New Testament Christian soldiers. First of all, if you're a child of God, Ephesians chapter 6, I believe this is important. And we looked at the whole armor of God last week. The sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. It ought to be stuck to you, amen? Just like Eleazar in that sword. But go to, go to Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible says we have an enemy. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you realize, and you may say, Clay, this is a very familiar passage. I know, but do we we actually stop and think about this? You have an enemy. You have an enemy. And this enemy, listen, is every bit as real as the troop of Philistines that came down on Shammah that day. But our enemy is not visible, not flesh and blood, but it's spiritual. You young people, you're under attack. You young men, you're under attack. Young ladies, you're under attack too. And we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. Can I tell you this? They've been at it a lot longer than you have. The devil's been wrecking lives for ages. Now, we don't have to be scared. Did you know that? Did you know that there, there is a real devil? There is a real devil. Listen, the other night, had a medical call, won't go into all the details, but the ambulance took a long time getting there. They took two or three wrong turns and was driving back country roads, and we were all the way down back here by Beaver Creek. One of the little gals on the ambulance said, we were encountering an evil spirit. That's what she told me. Well, one of the guys just, ah! And I said, well... But then she explained what happened, and I'm not sure if it was an evil spirit or not, but just weird stuff on the road while she was driving. And, I, and I, she said, I believe in all that stuff. And I said, well, I'm not scared of it. I said, but there are evil spirits. I said, you know, I've put my faith and trust in Jesus, and greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. And you know what's cool? Like the, the lady who was on the floor that we were helping, she's chiming in. You know, she, she loved the Lord, and so she was chiming in. But, uh, and you may say, well, are you supposed to do that? I'm a volunteer. What are they going to do, fire me? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so uh, but... But one of the other persons goes, ah, it's a bunch of nonsense. I'm not superstitious. I said, I'm not superstitious either. I said, but just like the the word of God says that there are principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness in this world, there's evil spirits in this world, devils. And, And listen, that doesn't mean we have to be scared. You may say, well, do they outnumber us? Yeah, they might. And can I just say this? If you were to stand in your own strength, you would become a casualty. And I believe the reason we ought to be more motivated to get in the Word of God and put on the whole armor of God is because, listen, like Shammah, I do not believe that Shammah stood because he was cocky and arrogant. I believe that Shammah decided something that everybody that was running, that had their backs to him, 
I believe that Shammah realized that it was God who fights the battles. And if he would stand, and you know what the Bible says? They fled, but he stood. And I simply say this, in the face of the enemy, I don't say we have to be cocky or anything, but can I just say this? Fleeing in cowardice is an act of disobedience when we've been called to stand in faith. We've been called to stand in faith. Listen, courage is the ability to do what you're called to do, to do your duty in face of danger. And listen, this soldier, he was standing and defending his ground. It is a crying shame that many times, far too often, we as Christians are not even willing to hold what we've got. Do you know the Bible says they that trust in the Lord and Daniel said will do exploits. Do you know it's okay to go on the offensive? That's right. 2 Corinthians 10, 2 through 5 says that though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. And then you know what he says? For the pulling down of strongholds. Do you know there's areas in our lives that the devil has set up a stronghold? He has no right to be there. And it's time that we don't just sit on defense. But by all means, if you understand, listen, do you know why the devil puts a stronghold somewhere? So he can get more. Why did he fight for a bean field? I believe Shama, unlike the other people running, realized that this troop of Philistines will not stop at the bean field. Amen. That's good. That's good. Everybody else ran. Where were they running to? And he said, well, maybe they were running home. Well, were they going to stand and fight when the Philistines got to their front door? How far are you going to run? Do you know there was a bean field? It didn't belong to the Philistines. And Shammah drew a line and said, I'm not running anymore. I'll stand right here and fight. I know that, that well, I'll get to the application part of this, but I know that Sometimes too much is made and people say, well, you don't want to be a rabble rouser and you don't want to, you don't want to, don't rock the boat. Can I just say this? The enemy has persistently been on the offensive and the Christians have been fleeing for far too long. Spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, listen, the Bible says there are powers, there are spiritual wickedness in high places, but if you will put on the whole armor of God, did you notice this armor is pretty personal? Belt of truth. Do you know what I want to be a part of? I want to be a part of an army of mighty men. But can I tell you something? I have to personally put on the belt of truth. On this particular day, nobody stood with Shammah. He had to stand alone. He had to stand alone. Ephesians 4.27. The Bible talks about spiritual warfare. You may not see it as such, but in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 24 says that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole Still no more. Do you know he gives practical illustrations of leaving the old life and walking in new life and right in the middle of it? I mean, he talks about anger. He talks about stealing. He says, put on the new man. He says, speak truth. Don't tell lies. He says, look, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, true holiness. Listen, victory for the Christian looks like righteousness and holiness. Do you know the grace of God's a beautiful thing? It's not a license to sin. When a Christian is walking in sin, they're not getting away with anything. They're getting their tail kicked. Let me repeat that. When a Christian is walking and living in sin, they're not getting away with stuff. They're getting their tail kicked. Victory looks like righteousness and true holiness. You know what righteousness and holiness is about? Do you know holiness means you're set apart? you got a calling. Braden, you know you got saved. You're not supposed to be just like everybody else. Amen. 
Do you know that? That's right. That's right. That's right. Naughty, you're a Christian. You're not supposed to be like everybody else. Amen? If you're saved, then you've been set apart for holiness. Now, if you're walking in victory, and by the way, that goes for all of you, Malia and all of you looking at me here, right? And Larry and Laurie and all of us. If we're, if we're walking in victory, we're going to be walking with the Lord. And when we give place to the devil in that little chapter 4 there, he says, neither give place to the devil. He talked about anger. He goes on to talk about stealing. And Do you know that if a Christian is tempted to steal and does it, and no one sees him do it, he hasn't won. He just lost. He just lost. He says, "If you let him that steal, st- let him that stole steal no more." Do you know that you cannot be a Christian thief? You can't be a Christian thief. But can a Christian steal? Yes, in a moment of defeat, he can. Can a Christian blow up in anger? Yes, but he shouldn't. And do you know that when you give in to the deeds of the flesh instead of walking in holiness, you're losing. You're giving place to the devil. It's like the devil shows up and you say, you know what? It's just a little bean patch. Just turn around and go. I'll do what everybody else does. Do you know that everybody bows up when people step on their rights? Do you know that living a Christ-like life, standing alone sometimes, means it looks like you're turning the other cheek? Sometimes it means that you love your enemy and have a good spirit when everybody else's attitude goes sour. When everybody else is being infected and defiled by bitterness, you stand with joy and don't get sucked into that. Do you know that the lost world, I'm convinced of this, the lost world is fueled. They love drama. Do you know a child of God should not love drama? We should be a peacemaker. Dad talked this morning about the people that God uses. Do you know that God will use you if you'll allow the love and the light of Christ to shine in you and overcome the darkness of this world? When somebody gossips, do you know you may say, well, that's just people gossiping. No, it's spiritual warfare. Are you going to get sucked down and defeated? Are you going to stand and fight? Listen, he stood. The Bible says that Shammah stood his ground, and he did not lose that ground. Listen, the Bible says in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you know if you're a child of God, I don't care if you've been saved for two weeks, you can resist the devil and get victory. He's a defeated foe. You don't have... Listen, my kids like to wrestle with me. And I like to wrestle with them occasionally. The, like last night, uh, Lucas, we'd lay, I laid him down. He wanted me to scratch his back, but he kind of gets ornery sometimes. And he shows affection in different ways, you know. Like some kids show affection by hugging you. He shows affection by jumping on you and knocking you around, you know. And so I'll tickle him and wrestle with him. And uh, sometimes, I haven't done it in a little while, but sometimes I'll actually get on the floor and they'll all get on top of me and jump on me and be wailing on wrestling. You know, they'll be, they'll be on top of me and I'll be flat down on the ground and they're just having a great time whooping daddy. But can I just say this? I know Luke is, is seven. He's big for his age. But I can whoop any seven-year-old in the county. <laughs> I'm just saying Right? Brother Mike Eccles is in here. Do you know that do you know that Saturday had a gal about that tall threatened to body slam me? I asked for a cup of coffee and she said, Well, we don't sell coffee. I said, Well, I'm not wanting to buy some. If you got a pot back there, I want a free cup. She said, Mr., I'm going to body slam you. And Mike said, I'll give you $5 if you do it. <laughs> and, and you know what I said? I said, ma'am, that is not going to happen. Now, I'm not, 
I'm not being proud, but can I tell you something? I can whoop any seven-year-old, boy or girl. <laughs> right? So sometimes I just let the kids jump on me. But anytime I choose, do you know that if I, if I want to resist them? Now, I know there will be a point in time. I said seven. I did not say 17, okay? <laughs> Braden and Mason, they're like, what age you going up to? <laughs> But do you know that if you're standing with the Lord, the Bible says you can resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Just like God told Israel in Leviticus that five of you can chase a hundred, a hundred of you can chase ten thousand. The Bible says that if you will draw nigh unto God, you can resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He guarantees you victory every time. And yet I see believers, listen, I see believers who are on a cycle of defeat. And when I say cycle, because it almost seems like that, it seems like there's just a regular cycle where they're up for a little while and then wham, the devil's got them down. And maybe, listen, maybe it's a habit, maybe it's a relational issue, but they get defeated. And you don't have to be defeated, the Bible says. Listen, you, you can, you've been promised victory. Now, if you've given ground to the devil, then you may need to put on the armor and get your weapons, 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of your warfare. And listen, the battlefield is in our mind, the Bible says. There are areas in your mind that you have just completely acquiesced and you've given up and you've fled the battlefield and it belongs to the devil. And the Bible says you need to get it back. The strongholds that you've allowed, you need to tear them down by the power of the Word of God. You need to stand your ground. Here's the practical application. I'm almost done. Where is your bean patch? Can I tell you something? There's an enemy. John 10, 10. Do you know the Bible says that, Jesus speaking, that He came to give life and life more abundantly. But you know, in the very same passage, he says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life, and life more abundant. Do you know the devil will lie to you? The devil will tell you that it's the Lord that's wanting to take stuff from you. Can I just say this? God will be a debtor to no man. If you'll surrender, not some, but if you'll surrender all to the Lord, he'll be a debtor to no man. What I'm saying is that God, listen, what God will do is he'll take your mess and he'll give you his miracle. He'll take your rags and he'll give you his righteousness. If you'll trust Christ, he will take the garbage you filled your life up with and give you his precious word and fill you with righteousness and holiness. God's a good God. Amen. God's a good God. But the devil's a liar. And you know what he'll tell you? He'll tell you that that bean patch ain't even worth fighting for. See, what bean patch? Well, I don't know. Young people, do you know that, that in, in your life, you young men, purity is going to be a fight that you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to make a covenant with your eyes. You're going to have to guard your heart because you're not just naturally going to stay clean in this old dirty world. And you, you know what I hear a lot of people? A lot of, I've heard Christians say, well, that's not really realistic, Clay. Kids are just going to whore around. You just, you know. I've had people, I've had even ministers basically imply that, hey, you know, it's our job just to clean up the mess. Well, yeah, if there's a mess, I'll help clean it up. But if I can keep them from making a mess, I'd like to do that too. Amen? Listen, God's great at recovery. I mean, God can restore, and we're all testimonies of that. But you don't, I had some, one time just recently, I had somebody say, I think there's a little bit of hypocrisy here. So why? And they, they started mentioning people who've been through messes, no doubt about it. Couple that got married didn't get together the right way. And they're saying, yeah, but then this sibling over here, you're all up, like y'all are not cool with... I said, yeah, listen, if there's a car wreck on Texana Road, I'll be the first one there. And if we can pull people out, doesn't matter whether they've been drinking or not, we are happy if they survive. And we'll help patch them up and we'll praise the Lord and sing when we know that they're better. Amen? 
but I ain't going to give you a beer and get you, set you in a car until you call us when you wreck. <laughs> we'll have a great time when you wreck, just like we did just then. No. Listen, people, I, I have people tell me this, well, well, nobody got married the right way and God's blessing their marriages. Listen, if you're a young person and you haven't messed up, stay clean. Stay victorious. Draw a line and say, listen, everybody else is leaving this area in mass. Even God's people, they're saying, you know what? That's a bean field that ain't worth fighting over anymore. I mean, look, the enemy's an army. This blows my mind. But listen, you cannot find godly Christian. I mean, you try to Google and just get King James Bible on audio with music in the background. You ain't going to find it. Pornography? Oh, what do you want? I'm telling you. It, the world is gathered in, in a troop, and they're coming after you. And can I tell you something? Your personal purity, your sexuality does not belong to this world. And sometimes we're going to have to draw a line and say, you know what? We're not walking away. We're not running away. We're going to stand and fight for this. I praise God for parents. Do you know that my mom and dad, a lot of the blessings that Lauren and I reach, that Lauren and I experience, that we've reached, is not because we just were victorious. It's because our parents decided to draw a line and fight for us. I know that. I've been married almost 20 years and almost 19, coming up 19 years. And I reap the benefits all the time of the foundation that mom and dad laid. And mom and dad had to fight some fights, I'm telling you. And they had to go against the grain. And they had to do things that nobody else was doing. But I praise God because God granted victory. Now, that's just one area. But let me very quickly say this. Let me lay out a couple of of pieces of ground, allotment, land that you ought to stand on. First of, all, first of all, in your personal life, you should demand victory in your personal life. And this starts, Christian, with your daily surrender to God. Here's the, here's the kind of the oxymoron in Christian victory. Victory comes through surrender. You, you submit to God, you draw near to God, and then you resist the devil. To win in the, in the Christian war, you have to be surrendered to God. Personal submission. Are there areas where you are unsubmitted and rebellious to God? Personally. Dad, mom, are there areas in your personal life where you are not submitted to God? Because that personal battle, listen, unless you stand alone, unless you're willing to stand against men, that may mean standing against lust or laziness. You must develop your own personal walk with the Lord. Do you have a prayer time personally? You say, well, I don't, I, I don't have a lot of, like when I'm with a big group and music playing, I feel it. But when it's just me by my bed, it doesn't seem kind of dry. Yeah, it seems kind of like beans, doesn't it? Listen, he didn't fight for the steak in El Steakhouse. He fought for a bean patch. That's right. That's right. Can I just say this? Your daily devotion time, sometimes it's kind of like dry cereal. Sometimes it's like oatmeal. It's, it, it will fill you. But can I tell you something? Sometimes, if you'll, but if you'll be disciplined and stay healthy and have a diet of the Word of God... Man, there's times when God will start to show you something and it's like strawberries and cream. Not all the time. Not all the time. And can I just say this? You don't have to fight over this. You don't have to be told to stand up and fight. We'll fight for our strawberries and cream. It's the bean patch that we have to be encouraged to fight over. Amen? That's just the daily protein, nutrients that, listen, the enemy wants to take it from you, but you better draw a line and fight for it. I, listen, I praise God. Listen, Lauren and Samuel, you know, I'm going, I'm turning on my coffee pot, and my wife's reading the Bible in her bedroom, and Sam's reading his Bible in the living room. So guess what I do? I read my Bible, duh. What, do you think I'm going to look carnal? I have to get my Bible, even if it's not as much as Sam's reading. I have to sit down and read something because I don't, I don't want to be, I'm supposed to be the pastor, amen? 
And you may say, well, y'all just have that, that habit. But you see me, I'm, I got the news in the morning and I got to check my Instagram and my Facebook and my, I won't call it what dad calls it, but, you know, Snapchat and all this and that. Can I tell you this? You don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You can draw a line and say, you know what? I spend time with the Lord yeah. first Amen. and do it. And create a discipline. Draw a line and say, this is a, a portion, an allotment. I'm going to carve out 15 minutes for the Lord. Five minutes. Start with five minutes. And listen, once you establish that personally, then dads, you ought to have a fight for the integrity of your home. Men, we are called to lead our homes. We're called to set the tone. Ephesians 6, 4. Isn't it interesting that before he says, be strong and fight, stand. Listen, he's going to give the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, 10. Do you know what he says in verse 4 to us dads? Bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're going to have to have your armor on, Dad, and here's a battleground. Are you going to raise up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Listen, some of you men here, you have been blessed by a wife and kids, and you are not bringing them up. You're letting them grow up like weeds. You're, listen, God forbid if the only spiritual food your kids get is here at this church house, they're going to be malnourished. Listen, you, you need to... The, the world is after them. Amen. It's indoctrinating them. You cannot set them down and turn on PBS or Nickelodeon. You cannot allow the world to raise your kids. You have to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But you know what most dads, even professing Christians, have done? Ah, we'll, we'll just bug out on this one. We'll run. God needs some shamas who will say, nope, I'm not running. Do you know the strength of the church is simply the combined strength of your personal life and mine? Don't say, well, hey, I want to be a part of a church that's big on the word. Well, are you? Are you personally? I want to be a part of a church that loves people. Well, do you? Do you know, can I tell you this? Loving people can be a fight. Yeah. That's right. You got some of, the, some of the neighbors we got, it's a fight to love people. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But it's worth it. Do you know, investing spiritually in the community, the church will only be as strong as we are individually. David's mighty men was on, were only mighty. Do you know why he gives a few of these little cameos? He doesn't tell us what all 37 guys did, but he gives a handful. He's letting us know that the strength of that corporate body was based on individual heroism. Each man was willing to stand, if necessary, by himself. Why could David, why was David able to take four or six hundred men? and send thousands of enemy soldiers to flight because every one of those men were like this guy right here. He said, I'll defend mine. Nehemiah built the wall because every man built that which was in front of his own house. Dads, it's time for us to be strong at home. And then we can make a difference in a church. And then we can make a difference in our community being salt and light. Do you know in many ways our country is our bean field. And we may need to fight for it. Amen. And it's under attack. I, I, listen, I thank God for the leadership here. <clears throat> and we should not be unkind. But, but you may say, well, <clears throat> what, what's the big deal? I, I know people who say, you think Christians are under attack. Christians are not under attack. Can I give you an example? With some of the political movement in Washington towards the transgender movement, the real goal is not to give them something that they don't have. The goal is to silence anybody who will actually stand and say, wait a minute, there is a God-given and scientific fact. The goal, listen, this was true years ago. A homosexual activist said this, that our goal is not to come out of the closet. It's to put those that disagree with us in it. That, that was their goal. And, and can I just say this? How that works out, 
is when, when they pass laws and they say, well, it's for equality or it's for tolerance or acceptance. What they are being is they want to be extremely intolerant of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And can I say this? If there's young people who have been confused and indoctrinated, we, don't, we should not hate them. We should love them. Can I just say this? In my opinion, all teenagers are confused in that area. They are. I mean, guys think that they're some kind of little, you know, Banny Rooster stud horse, and they don't, under, they don't understand love or sexuality at all. And girls, many of them, are simply needing acceptance. And listen, there's a lot of confusion in those years. And then some people, they don't fit into a certain mold, and they don't have a parent and a, a mom and a dad that love them. And there is some honest-to-goodness confusion. And listen, those people are not the enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But what they're wanting to do is cut the legs of the truth out from under the church. And if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? And you may say, well, how is it an attack? Here's how it's an attack. It's already been happening. You know, there were like Catholic organizations that were being sued because they would not hire people that absolutely disagreed with, with their own policies. And can I tell you this? One particular account I was reading, when they shut down a Catholic orphanage, because they wouldn't adopt to same-sex couples. It wasn't because there was a bunch of other organizations willing to be orphanages to care for the kids. My point is they didn't care for the kids. They just wanted to shut down anybody that disagreed with them. Now, I don't believe the church will be effective at being salt and light in those big areas. And by the way, in, in America... We don't, the Bible says, render to Caesar that which is Caesar. Do you know who our Caesar is? We the people. And our founder said, we have no king but Jesus. Right. Amen. 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 What I'm saying is, my, I've heard, I know people who, dis, who disagree. They believe that at this point we should just exempt ourselves from the political discussion. But can I just say that when we do that, the Philistines win. We need to be walking in the love and grace of Jesus, but we don't need to be scared to stand on the truth. Amen. Amen? We don't need to be scared to stand on the truth. And if somebody says, well, I think that's hateful, then explain to them it's not hateful. It's not hateful. Explain the gospel. That Listen, apart from Christ, those that persist in sin, those that reject God's word and God's truth, and those that, listen, are the enemies of God's standard, they are on their way to a devil's hell, and Christ in the cross stands in the way, and we can have victory in evangelism and in making a difference. But I think it first starts with us getting our own bean fields defended personally. Personally. I just want to challenge you. Listen, I, I, I was thinking about the fact that I was invited to come and speak at a revival, and I was asking myself, like, what would it look like in our church for us to have revival? I don't mean like a scheduled revival, but like for us to be walking in a state of revival. You know what it would mean? It would mean that our consciences and hearts would be quickened by the Spirit and the Word of God, that we'd be sensitive to sin and led by the Spirit of God, And I believe some of you do walk in revival. But you know it's possible for your neighbor on the pew with you to be in revival and you be in total lukewarm apostasy. It's got to be a personal. I really believe that there has to be a personal interaction with the Holy Spirit of God. And as you win the battle personally. So tonight, tomorrow, Philistines are coming. There's a troop. They're organized and you're outnumbered. But the Bible says this, if you'll stand, God can rot. Listen, he fought and God wrought a victory. God can work a victory if you'll stand. I believe that, amen? And so I want to challenge you. I'm going to ask Megan to come to the piano. There's areas in your life where you've just decided to run. You may say, you know those Israelites that ran though? I mean, they weren't surrendering to the Philistines. They just didn't care to engage with them that day. That's right. And do you know what? We don't know their names. Who ran away that day? I don't know. Did Joab run away? I don't know. Did 
did Abishai or Asahel, some of these mighty men of David, where were they? Did, did Eliezer, did these guys? We don't know. Listen, the names of the anonymous hordes running for the hills is not given to us. All we know is this one dude stood and he got a victory. Amen. You know, some, it, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard for me to stand in a place where it feels like the majority's not there. But I have, to, I have to educate my heart and mind by the word of God and then stand on the truth. Amen. 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 And you know what I've seen? I've seen that if you'll do that, God will give victory. If you'll say, I'm going to stand in this area, whether it be finances, relationships, if you'll stand where God says to stand, he can give victory. Husbands, you need to go home and love your wife like Christ loved the church. Some of you have surrendered that ground. You say, well, you know what? We get along. She doesn't really need a spiritual leader. The Bible says she needs a spiritual leader. A man that she's able to respect and honor and a man that will love her like Christ loved the church. Ladies, the Bible says that a, a wise woman can build her house and a foolish one, woman can tear it down with her own hands. You know what happens when a woman tears down her own house with her own hands? She's a, she, she, she's a casualty in spiritual warfare. You may say, well, she won. No. No. See, the Bible makes it clear. Husbands and wives, y'all are not your, each other's enemies. <laughs> You're on the same team. And you have the same enemy. It's time to stand and fight the real enemy. And that's the devil. We need to stand on God's word. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. This message has been aimed at Christians. I may not have addressed specifically the particular piece of ground that you've surrendered to God. Listen, some of you, you've just been getting whipped little bit by little bit. And the more you see others run, the less desire you have to stand and fight. But God has convicted you that you need to fight. Young people, I love you singing for the Lord. But you got to be living for the Lord too, you know it? Are you winning the battle? And if you're here and you'd say, Brother Clay, I'm not saved tonight. I'm not even sure about all that. The Bible is very simple. Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again. Jesus is alive. He took care of our sin problem on the cross. And if you trust Him, call on His name. He'll save you. Have you done that? As she plays, the invitation's open. If you can do business with God where you're at, or if you need to come to an altar, that's what it's there for. But if you need to talk to somebody, the pastor will meet you right here. Man, I want a group of shamas. I want a group of mighty men. Men that will say, I'm not, I'm not giving up my bean field today. Not today. She's going to play another verse. If you need to come, now's the time. Would you come? Just a few more moments. Just a few more moments. If you need to come, you come. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Jesus loves you.